all sorts of things conspire to keep us from following Jesus. Other people, religion, danger. But perhaps the most insidious is this. Once a man ran up to Jesus and said, Master, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus answered him by saying, Well, keep the commandments. And the man said, Good, I've done that. And Jesus said, But there's one thing more. Go and sell everything that you have and give it away to the poor. Then come and follow me. And the man went away very sad because apparently he was very wealthy. Now it's very hard to explain away the shocking words of Jesus in this story. So let's not try to explain it away. Let's try to accept it at face value and try to figure out what it means for us. Because right after this, Jesus turns around to his disciples and says, it is very hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. In fact, wealth does prevent some people from following Christ. Jesus said, we cannot serve two masters. And money is a master. Whether we are willing to accept the fact or not, there is a spiritual power in money. And if we want to learn how to follow Christ, we have to learn how to overcome the power of money and to serve Christ only. Now, how do we do this? Well, I'm not so sure if I've figured it out myself. The Greek word of the week is memonas, which translates as wealth or riches. Jesus said that his disciple cannot worship both God and wealth. Was he thereby condemning money and wealth, prosperity, a deep bank account? The complicated answer to that question is probably both yes and no. No, he probably wasn't condemning money and possessions and wealth per se, since these are only objects in varying amounts. We're cheating a bit, but if we reach outside of Mark's Gospel to Luke's Gospel, we find Jesus there giving a blessing on the poor and cursing the rich. The words used there in Luke's Gospel are better translated as paupers and misers. A pauper is someone who by definition has little if nothing and must rely on what's outside himself for his sustenance. A miser is someone who has everything and tends to rest in his own self-sufficiency. For their part, paupers understand the essence of faith, for it is to rely absolutely on the providence of God, whereas misers, again, tend to become self-involved and can't understand why they would need to rely on anything outside themselves. So it's not really about God versus money, but it's about what the disciple must trust in, what our priority is. Is it our own sufficiency, talent, education, and wealth? Or is it the providence, power, presence, and promise of God? It's one or the other. It can't be both. While living in Cameroon, I struggled with the issue of wealth and poverty on a daily basis. As a missionary, I made a, a modest salary paid for by the mission board and lived in a house that was provided by that board. But every month I would pay small stipends to the pastors who worked for the missions. It was a mere pittance compared to my own salary. It was barely enough to, to feed their family, much less send their children to school or buy needed medicine, or even to take the bus uh, to a neighboring town to attend a wedding. Even if I were to give away all of my salary, I know there would have been hundreds and thousands of other needs. And no matter how modest my own salary was, I knew that I had a safety net back home. I had a savings account in a bank. I had friends and family who would help or support in times of trouble. As a middle-class American, I'm born of privilege. And even though I'm thankful for that fact, I can't help but think that that young man who approached Jesus was also middle class and privileged. And I can't help but wonder what Jesus would say to me. Here's a story of someone who travels overseas regularly and also regularly struggles with the issue of poverty and wealth. The poorest place I've ever been to in the world is Haiti. I was there last May with a team and the people there are living in tents. They basically have nothing. 
And when we go to a place like that, we often uh, have a hard time accepting the reality of that because we see ourselves in living in such luxury and in contrast it's such a difference between the way we live and the way they live. Um, they have no medical care, they have no schools left, they are dependent on outsiders for everything, their own government can't cope and so you know, I personally, when I witness something like that, I feel that it's um, definitely not what God's wishes for creation, and that it's our job to take care of them. One of the things that I often hear is, why shouldn't we just take care of our own? Our own is everybody, because we are all children of God. Often people don't know how to go about helping people that are in poverty. And I think one of the best ways is to work with organizations and groups that are already in existence, that know what they're doing. Um, I think it's a mistake for us as Americans to just assume that we know how to fix everything. And often what I'll hear is that people that go to live in a foreign country, they think, well, after I've lived there for six months, I'll know everything I need to know and I'll understand the people and the culture and then I'll be able to fix all their problems. But what really happens is after six months, they realize they know even less than they thought they would ever know. And so, you know, working in the conference office, I really believe that we as a connectional church should be working with our missionaries on the ground, our NGO partners, and other people that really understand the culture and really know what the situation is and how best to, to resolve those issues. When I see poverty, I, I feel a sense of responsibility because I feel that if God has sent me to this place to see what's happening there, that there must be a reason. That I can't just go back home and live my life the way I always did before and just say, well, that was their situation, but I'm not in that. I feel like I need to do something that, about that situation, that, that God has put me there as a witness. And um, it's important for me to share that message with other people and, you know, do what I can to change it. As disciples of Jesus Christ, I believe that there are three levels of economic work that we are called to do. First is a level of personal charity. If a mother with her hungry children come to the door and ask for food, I can give food. I can give so that the children may eat. But this is only a temporary solution. The children eat and are full, but tomorrow they will be hungry again. The second level is organized philanthropy. We ask ourselves, what can we do to help the family have money to buy food tomorrow and the next week in the future? And so with the help of a church or an organization, we seek to create jobs or income generating projects that will create wealth and sustain the welfare of people into the future. But even this is not enough. Eventually we have to ask the question, why is our society organized in such a way that there's such a big gap between the rich and the poor? Why is the wealth concentrated in the hands of only a few? And so we move to the third level called social justice. And we seek for ways to eliminate poverty itself. We might do this by changing laws, reforming government, or simply changing people's attitudes and understandings. John Wesley here again. I was the Dave Ramsey of 18th century England. I have three simple rules about the use of money. First, gain all you can. By that, I mean that you should not, of course, gain money at the expense of our health, nor by hurting our minds. And of course, we should not hurt our neighbors. Second, save all you can. Don't use any part of it to gratify the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eye, or pride of life. But I really want the new iPhone. As I said, don't throw your money away on idle expenses. And finally, the third rule is to give all you can. Just remember that when God brought you into being and placed you onto this world, he placed you here as a steward and he entrusted you with the goods of various kinds. But they still belong to him, 
So gain all you can, save all you can, give all you can. Jesus asked the rich young man to start with an act of personal charity. He asked him to sell all of his possessions and give the money to the poor. It starts with personal charity, but only starts. The rest will come when we adjust our attitudes and expectations towards wealth. Now this might be the most difficult stretch of road for, for most of us, because if you happen to be watching this episode on a TV in an air-conditioned room, munching on a donut and sipping on your coffee, then you are rich. You are rich. And so what would Jesus say to you? I'm off to get my own donut. See you on the way.